So yeah, hi everybody, I'm Dana, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about their natural black bear behavior and some things that you can do if there's, uh, you have any interactions with them. So first, just to go through a little bit of uh, a year in the life of a bear. So I'll start with summer. So summer is usually, we kind of consider it about May through the end of August, and this is typically their breeding season. Um, now, females will start breeding when they're about three to four years old usually. It, it can vary a little bit, but um, that's usually about the time they start breeding. Cubs will stay with their mom for a year and a half. So at this point, those yearlings now are going to start to be leaving their mom in that, that second summer of theirs. Um, then we move into fall, and this is hyperphagia. So this is from that September through the end of December is usually what we consider it. And hyperphagia means that they are in this um, physiological state where all they want to do is eat. They, um, their bodies know that they have to prepare for winter coming up and denning, and um, it doesn't necessarily matter what, what latitude they're at for that. They just need to eat, eat, eat. And they will go and eat up to about 20,000 calories per day. So you can imagine that with that bear that was here in the ghost town, that was November. He needed those 20,000 calories. Uh, a couple, you know, bruises and stuff weren't going to stop him. His brain was hardwired just to eat. Um, and so then in the winter, so pregnant females, they will den. But out here and in a lot of the, the southern states, um, denning by males and females that aren't pregnant, it, it varies. It's, um, some will, some won't. Others will still be moving around, but they'll maybe use a day bed here or there, you know, bed down for like a week and then get back up and move. Um, and some of that's just because with the mild climate here, there's more food still available and, and those sorts of things. Um, females that are pregnant will give birth around the beginning of February, and um, they usually stay in the den with their, their newborn cubs till about sometime in April, um, and then they'll get up and we'll start the year again. And so bears are omnivores. They eat um, all sorts of things, all sorts of plants mostly. They will eat uh, animal matter, but usually it's in the form of insects. Um, if they can get their paws on a deer or javelina, they would do that too. Um, or if they find some carrion, you know, roadkill somewhere, dead animals, they'll, they'll totally eat that as well. Um, but most of their diet is made up of all of these plants, and I'm sure there's plenty missing from this list out here. Um, but with the, the sotol and the yucca, they'll kind of go and they'll bend down those outer leaves and get to the heart of the, the uh, plants and eat that. And then they've got all those other berries and acorns and nuts around to eat. Um, and bears have a really amazing sense of smell. They can smell things from up to about two miles away. So, um, you know, that's another reason for securing attractants, even if you don't always have bears around. Um, now that you know that they are coming out this way, um, they'll smell that, you know, barbecue in the dumpster from a long ways away, and they know that they can get a lot more calories so much more quickly out of that than they can, you know, sitting around and eating acorns. So, um, you know, even if there's not one right, right in town, it's still important to keep those attractants secured. So to talk just a little bit about natural black bear behavior, um, this video isn't exactly the best, but uh, I was on a trail at Big Bend National Park and walking along the trail came up to this bear. Um, I had already yelled, he looked up, knew I was there. But in the case of, of natural behavior, you can see he's just doing what he's doing. He's not really paying attention to me, but he did know that I was there. Um, you know, he's not staring at me, he's relaxed. There are a lot of behaviors that people don't recognize are signs of stress in animals. So um, jaw popping, stomping, bluff charging. I mean, you'd probably imagine that the bluff charge is a sign of stress, but the jaw popping, I'll show you in a minute. Um, sometimes people think it's cute. They think it's funny. They don't recognize that this is a sign that the animal is uncomfortable. Um, and they might do these defensive behaviors when, yeah, they just feel cornered or there is a food source nearby, so they're trying to kind of protect that, that resource. Um, and they might feel cornered in situations that you don't even recognize, you know, that, that that's what's happening. So it might look like there's um, 
you know, uh, woods behind them or something, and they can just go back into that. But they might know there's something else back there, and you know, you're blocking their way out. So um, it's always a good idea to kind of be aware of your surroundings. Now, with predatory behaviors, um, it's going to look a lot different. A bear that's trying to predate on you is going to be silent. They're going to be staring at you. They're going to be stalking and following you continuously. Um, you know, their head will be lowered and things like that. So um, I have a couple videos to show you to, to um, show some of these behaviors. So I had a video of a bear that wasn't in a trap doing some of these, but it wasn't loading. So we've got some from the, the bear in the trap, but it's the same idea. Um, so you can see that, that jaw popping there. Um, I think the next video is a little bit better maybe. Um, and so this is one from a trap in Florida. Um, yeah, again, that, that jaw popping, they're going to do like sort of a, a huffing sound. Um, those are all signs that they're uncomfortable, back up, get away. They're really, bear attacks really are not very common. Um, from 2000 to 2017, there are only 210 confirmed bear attacks in the lower 48. Um, most of these, again, these were defensive and they were females with cubs, um, and a lot of them involved pet dogs. So that's, that's one thing that is, is difficult. When you have a dog um, and the dog starts barking at the bear, you know, it, what can you expect the bear to do but, you know, get involved and then some, you know, it escalates from there. Um, a lot of them had, uh, you know, attractants around, food was involved, um, other things. And a lot of times it was a bear that had previously been around attractants, gotten into um, dumpsters or whatever in the area. For fatal attacks, that's even more rare. Um, there are only 63 confirmed fatal attacks from 1900 to 2009 by a black bear. And most... Uh, only 14 of those from the lower 48. So bears up in Canada and Alaska, um, things are different up there, um, just with it being so much more, um, uh, they're so much more isolated up there. So when they do see a, a person, um, it's kind of a more novel situation is uh, the way it's been ex explained to me why there might be a little bit more predation up there. Um, and these were all adult male bears um, or sub-adult male bears. Um, only a few were females with cubs. Um, usually a person alone out on a trail um, and a fair amount of those also had food or some sort of garbage was present. So it's, it is really rare but it could happen. Um, so the things that you want to do when you're out and about, when you're out hiking, um, always be aware of your surroundings. You don't want to accidentally sneak up on an animal or any of those things, so you know, pay attention to what's around you. And typically you want to hike in groups and stay together, and especially if you have young kids, don't let them you know, wander off. Um, you want to keep them near you and within sight. Um, again, dogs are, are a tricky one, so you definitely want to make sure that they're leashed if you have them with you, but you know, better yet, just don't bring them on your hiking trip. Um, I mean, it's sad. I have dogs, too. I love to go hiking with them. But um, when you're in bear country, it, it, it gets tricky. And, and there are rules in the national park anyway. So um, there are things you have to consider aside from bears. And when you are walking, especially when you're in a more thicker habitat, um, make noise. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you might have seen it on TV or things. They walk around and just, hey, bear, you know, and, and things like that. Or there are bear whistles and, you know, just constant every little while make some noise make sure that if there is something in the area they know you're there is the point um, and then i didn't bring it up here but we do have uh, bear yeah bear spray is um yeah and krista's got it back there but uh bear spray is a really nice tool to have um, if you do happen to get into a bad situation um, it comes in really handy and it works for other animals not just bears um, so it's like a pepper spray, but instead of the, the human one, this one makes a big cloud. So, um, and you want to use it while the bear is still relatively um, kind of far away. But uh, 
if you do get bear spray, it's a good idea to, to look online, make sure you understand how to use it. Um, we're not going over that today. And so with your dog, you want to make sure you keep them leashed. Um, don't let them go chase after a bear or, you know, go up to a bear. I mean, I, I think that's fairly obvious, but, you know, it, it happens. Um, and if you do encounter a bear while you're with your dog, just try to get your dog close to you and just back away and um, try to get away from the area. Um, one thing I didn't say yet, do not run. Don't turn your back on the bear. Just back away. Make yourself look big. Make sure the bear knows you're there. Um, you know, yell at it and, and back away. Stay calm. But um, yeah, with your dog, of course, that, that's why it gets a little bit trickier if you do have them with you. And so if you're camping, you want to make sure that you keep your campsite clean. Um, don't cook right next to your tent. You want to keep that separated. Don't bring any of your food back to your tent. Um, don't bring any other smelly things into your tent. Um, it's great if you have a bear box at the campsite or if you have, they have the little bear canisters, um, some different things. Uh, you want to make sure that that bear can't get to your food at your campsite. Um, there are a couple other methods that, that you can use to secure your stuff as well. Um, and, you know, again, you just really want to think about all the other smelly things. You know, if you have, like, raspberry-scented uh, lotion and you slather yourself in that before you go jump in your tent for the night, you know, that's, that's also an attractant. So you want to be aware of all those other things that smell like that. There's a great video online of <laughs> a man, I'm not, I forget where exactly he is, but um, he was out in, in the woods somewhere and this, it looks like probably a young bear is um, following him. He's backing up and, you know, telling the bear, you know, back off and the bear keeps following him and it goes on for about three minutes and, uh, you know, the, the, Finally, the bear keeps coming a little bit closer and a little bit closer, and finally he uses his bear spray, and it's great. It's just one little puff of, of spray, and the bear turns around and runs off. So um, he did a couple things that, you know, one, if you're being stalked by a bear, please probably don't record it. Um, I think focus on getting away. Um, obviously, walking backwards, um, you know, it would be easy enough to trip if you're focused on trying to, you know, get the video while you're doing that. That could be dangerous. Um, you know, if you need to, uh, if you have a, a second where you think it's safe to grab something to throw at the bear, that's a great option too. Um, but again, you don't want to get on the ground. That, that could be dangerous. And you don't want to turn your back. You don't want to run. Going back a little bit on our... TPWD's bear behavior category. So when we're getting these reports and assessing situations, we kind of look at it. Um, we kind of put them into different categories just so that we all are on the same page about what's happening. Um, we do accept general reports and sightings, so that's great. We want to hear about it. We want to know that you guys saw bears, um, you know, where you were, and if you can, if they have any identifying features, those sorts of things. Um, but then if they are at, you know, a dumpster, at the deer feeder, those sorts of things, that puts them in a different category. So now they're using um, human-provided foods, and we want to keep track of that. Um, we have a behavior three, which is the, the habituated bear. So they're repeatedly coming back to the dumpsters, repeatedly coming back to deer feeders, those sorts of things. Now they know, they associate those sorts of structures with food um, and potentially people with food. We have a special one for bears in high human use areas and school zones. Um, obviously, if there's a bear right next to a school, that's something we need to do something about um, right away. It's a little bit different than a bear, you know, in a, a, off on a ranch somewhere and with the, the children and everything. Um, so then we have behavior five and six for bears that have killed or injured livestock or repeatedly killed or injured livestock. We haven't encountered those sorts of bears really in, in the state, um, and hopefully we never do. That would be nice. Um, I think we've had like one case of a bear that killed some chickens. Um, you know, d where those fall in line, it's a little bit different than, you know, killing a, a goat or something. So, um, and 
I think we've had one case where a bear came close to people in Black Gap, um, but, but that's about it. It's really rare right now, and we want to keep it that way. So um, that's why we're here talking to all of you, so that we can make sure that doesn't change. Um, and so we have some different response app actions, options that we can take. Um, so one, of course, we can you know, take the information, visit with you guys, um, give you some information on what things you should be aware of, what you can do. Um, and that's in the case where you know, there's nothing going on, really. Um, if it's a bear that's getting into dumpsters, then that's where you know, we're kind of at that action, too. We want to make sure that people start making some changes. They need to secure their, their trash, need to secure whatever other attractants they have. Um, if they are making those changes and the bear is still coming back or there's some, some attractants that we can't control yet, um, we will try aversive conditioning like we talked about with the bear here. Um, so that's all those things like the, the rubber buckshot or paintballs. Um, you know, just yelling at the bear is a good idea too and, and that's something that, that you all can do. Don't let the bear come up on your porch and you know, it might look cute but that's really not cute and, and it might be fine right now in the moment but when it goes to your neighbor's porch they might not be expecting it. It could be a problem. So we don't want the bear to associate um, anything good with being near people. Um, so then we can move to action four, which is translocate to the closest designated location, which is you know, obviously what we ultimately did with the bear here. Um, and it's not something that we want to do. You know, it's, that's, that's, we're getting down to some, some difficult decisions. Um, obviously, taking a bear out of its home where it knows and moving it somewhere else is, is tough for the bear or potentially tough for the bear. I mean, I know I wouldn't want to just be picked up and moved wherever. Um, but also, if attractants aren't secured, as I think we've already talked about, you know, the bear could likely come right back. So, you know, we went through all of that time, effort, stress on the animal, um, manpower, you know, just for the bear to, to have to take a little bit of a longer walk to come back. Or another bear might move in. So we really need the emphasis to be on the community to, to secure all those things um, before we get to that. In this case, it was a little bit special because we knew that you all were trying. We knew it was going to take time to get those dumpsters out here. Um, and we were in that, that hyperphagia time. That bear was not going to leave. Um, and we also had an option to move it to Black Gap. Uh, we only have certain places that we can release bears. Um, and you know, some considerations go into that of if the, the case makes sense. So in this case, that bear you know, is coming from an environment similar to Black Gap. So it, it made sense that bear we knew was going to be fine out there. Whereas if we had um, some sort of similar issue up in, um, out in East Texas, we wouldn't want to take a bear from there and move it to Black Gap. You can imagine that that would be really difficult for that bear. Um, we do have uh, the option to euthanize or transfer to a zoo if a facility has space. Um, you know, obviously, especially in, in Texas, with them being a threatened species, um, and on this recolonizing front, we really, really, really don't want to do that. And that would be a major decision that would involve a lot of um, people up in leadership and everything before that happens. Um, but if, you know, in certain conditions, it, it might be necessary. 